Well, welcome to another Cutting Edge show. I'm Omar Neal, the former mayor of Tuskegee, Alabama, host of the You Got the Power show and host of, well, co-host of the Cutting Edge show. Uh, welcome to this great, great, great show we have today. I'm so excited about the lineup we got today. We want to make sure that you uh, follow us on Facebook, uh, YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter. Make sure you like and share so that others uh, can really uh, benefit from uh, this wonderful exchange. Uh, we are so excited uh, to bring forth uh, my sidekick. Uh, we call him Dr. T in these parts, but he's Dr. Stephen Thomas. Please join me in welcoming uh, my, uh, my, my man, my friend, a brother from another mother, Dr. Stephen B. Thomas. Hey, man, what's up? It's always good to be here with you, Mr. Mayor. But what a complex world we're in from mm. the last time we met. We got a war going on in the midst of a pandemic. Right. Well, and you a know, a lot of suffering that we need to address and look for the silver linings that can help bring us together. I don't disagree with you, Doc. But, you know, there's a war going on someplace everywhere. Uh, this is one that's been put into the forefront, but there's always conflict. Uh, and and people are suffering and we got to figure out a way uh, to focus on on the suffering of people and have empathy mm -hmm. uh, for people, even when we don't uh, feel it directly. But, you know, again, you know, what comes what goes around comes around. I tell people all the time, <laughs> if it hadn't happened to you, you ain't nothing but next. Right. <laughs> so 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 that's what that's about, man. Let, let, let me let me let me uh, say this, man. We we got this great show mm -hmm. uh, coming up. Uh, I mean, you know, this is Women Month, right? Right, right, right. But let me tell you International. this: international. What, what, what? Let me say this: every month is Women's Month. <laughs> <laughs> every day is Women Day. There you go. Right. I don't know why they're gonna separate. Now mm. we know that's the case. And well, so, you say that about Black History Month too. Absolutely. Every day, huh? It, that's right, and and that's how we need to really, really look at it. We also need to uh, uh, let people know uh, that the people we have today, our guests. I mean, I'm just uh, every one of them are very special to me, and uh, and so I want people to know we got uh, Dr. Terry Ann Scott who's going to be joining us, mm. uh, uh, Dorothy Walker, all the way down in Montgomery, Alabama, right? All right, right, and Dr. Julian Malvo. Uh, over in California, so All we right. got the we got the east, the south, <laughs> and the west covered. Uh, what a lineup! On, 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 uh, uh, what a lineup! So hmm. we we got all of that. Let's go back to to our team behind the scene, uh, because it's so important that we recognize yes uh, our, our team. Meg Jordan, who heads up our tech team, there we assisted go. by Maggie uh, Daly, Sharia Khan, uh, who is our social media and communication specialist, mm -hmm. and of course, Kimberly Fleming, uh, social media and uh, media uh, curator, curator. And uh, lastly, but certainly not least, uh, this, the man with the sound uh, <laughs> uh, is uh, uh, Elijah Pugh Jr. Love uh, the beat, so love that I'm, beat. Yeah, man, he's, he's, he's a bad dude, man. So we are so appreciative of all the people who make us look good. Uh, you you see us on on front in front of the camera, but the people behind the camera make it all happen. So we all are right. so appreciative. Some uh, snaps them. for them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Come on now. Good. Good. Let's 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 start this thing, man. Let's get this thing going. Uh, why don't we uh, pull up our first <laughs> guest today, uh, Dr. Terry Ann Scott? Let me tell you this: she's the mm. chair of the Department of History at Hood College. Uh, just recently, I met her in uh, Montgomery. Alabama. All right. Uh, and, you know, I, you know, you, those people that you meet, you say, I'm going to, we're going to be friends from henceforth and forevermore. Okay. And uh, you just kind of know that when you meet them, uh, I was so very, very, very impressed with her. Uh, but, you know, she has a book out. I want you to go to a book first, and then we're going to come back to her that book out mm. is mm. coming out this week. Right. Okay. I'm so excited about it. I I, I want to get one of those first copies and then we're going to have her, uh, you know, on again so we can talk about this book because we're going to do a show just on her book oh, at great. some juncture. 
Absolutely. So, good, good. Hey, Dr. Terry Ann Scott, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm well. Thank you so much for having me. And the feeling was mutual. I'm, I'm glad that you invited me. I'm honored to be here. And I can't wait to have this discussion. And thank you for talking about my book. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Well, tell the people a little bit about yourself. Introduce yourself to our audience. Absolutely. So I'm originally from Chicago. I now teach at Hood College in Maryland. I used to be at the University of Washington. I specialize in African-American history, um, both on the civil rights movement. So I, I travel a lot with a new organization, Common Power. They've been around for a few years and we take people on tours through the South and mm. teach them about the history of African-Americans and voter suppression to help them move to action for today which is how we met each other last week when we were at the Freedom Riders Museum. <laughs> Absolutely. Excellent. Yeah, just, I mean, just what they're doing is incredible uh, hmm. because they're taking young people so that they can really see and understand so that they can contextualize what's happening in their contemporary situations. Mm -hmm. See, if you don't know your history, you don't know where you are and you have no idea where you're going. Absolutely. Right. And so and so uh, they're, and the they're, they're structuring that, uh, Dr. T. They're really they have a structure for that. They're very yeah. intentional about it. We are. And we make sure to teach young people of color how to become. We're shaping them into the future leaders. So we help them recognize their roles as that and support them as they move into that. Wow. Right. right. And that's yeah. powerful. Go ahead, Dr. T. Yeah. And, and Dr. Scott, as you as you see what's happening in the in the schools, efforts to take some of the take the history out. Yeah. make certain topics taboo, mm -hmm. some of the things we're going to talk about tonight, how, how might we address that? And how has this pandemic maybe exposed new ways of making a difference? So we might, well, one of the things I think that the pandemic, it's brought so much to the fore, right? When we start to see in this post-George Floyd moment, okay. many people were home paying attention to this. Mm -hmm. These are not the first instances of this kind of racialized brutality, but more people witnessed it, more people reacted to it in a positive way, but you also have those forces that move against it and mm -hmm. say, let's pretend like racism and structural inequality doesn't exist. Let's make sure we can't talk about these things in school. One of the ways that we can address this, mm -hmm. we have so much power when we go to our local school boards okay. or we run for school board. It is very easy to go and register and run to be on the school board because they have a lot of power in the curriculum that comes up in these in these states. The other thing is, for instance, in Texas, the lieutenant governor and the governor are the ones who are trying to remove, quote unquote, CRT from the schools. We know that's, what that means. They don't want to talk right. about race or racism in general. That's right. But if we can remove those individuals from office okay. and replace them with somebody who is forward thinking, then we're able to eliminate their efforts to try to, dis to, to dissolve the truth. Mm, wow. Mm. Powerful. Oh. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Terry <laughs> and you. Scott. Absolutely. Good. Oh, good. I'm so happy uh, to, to, to have you, Dr. Scott. We're going to we're going to have a really good conversation today. Happy to, to be say here. This. Absolutely. Let's bring up uh, Dorothy Walker. Uh, Ms. Dorothy Walker is the site director of the Freedom Rides Museum in Montgomery, Alabama. I've been knowing her for a month of Sundays. Mm -hmm. uh, and a uh, very, very good person. I consider a friend. Uh, she is one of those people that in, when you come into her presence, she lighten your day. If she has a bright, <laughs> she has a, she has a bubbly personality, a smile that, that is, that's, that illuminates the, the room and, and just a, a person who's committed to history. She's been working uh, in the area of history. I think maybe her whole career, I don't know if she's mm -hmm. done anything but that. I mean, she's really, um, you know, committed to understanding what transpired and how to contextualize it, mm -hmm. as was shared by uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Scott. Uh, please uh, help me in welcoming All right. uh, my dear friend, uh, Dorothy Walker. <laughs> Dorothy, welcome. welcome. How are you doing? Hi. <laughs> that, was, that was such a kind introduction. I don't know that I can live up to all that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, you can. Good. Let, let me, let's, let's uh, tell people about you. You know, I mean, who is Dorothy Walker? <laughs> well, I'm going to, I'm going to defer to who is Dorothy Walker and just defer to why, who am I in my, in my capacity? Um, I am the site director for the Freedom Rides Museum. And 
Um, for those of you who do not know, the Freedom Rise Museum is located in what was Montgomery's first Greyhound bus station. Hmm. Um, and um, we are in the bus station um, and we are a historic site of the Alabama Historical Commission, which is the State <laughs> Historic Preservation Office. So the State Preservation Office, our, our mission is to help preserve the places in, across the state where um, historical events uh, important to not only Alabama's history, but to the nation's history. Um, we try to help preserve those places, not only preserve and, and, and interpret them, but also promote them. Um, so that, you know, that's a very important thing. Um, and it's a mission that we've been carrying out here for um, since the early 1960s. So, um, of course, I haven't been here that long, but <laughs> the ACC <laughs> has been around for a while. And we were at the forefront of a lot of different things when it came to civil rights history, for sure. Um, we, we were deeply involved in getting the Selma to Montgomery Trail. Um, and, you know, and Mayor Neal was around for all of that way okay. back in the day, um, right. trying to get that designated as a National Historic Trail. And so there's been a lot of effort over the years by the agency. So I came in and on the tail end of the planning for the Free Rides project and outlasted everybody else to be director. Um, <laughs> so I'm the first full time director we've had, but the museum has been here for 10 years. Okay. Um, and I've only been director for five, but the first five years, we didn't have a, a, a person who who was dedicated as director. So it's been great being the steward of the story because yes. um, a lot of people come to Montgomery and you know this, Mayor Neal, because you, mm -hmm. you've been around doing this for a long time that a lot of people get what the Freedom Rides their mission and their legacy, they get it confused with the bus boycott because right, a lot right. so a lot of people is all bus, bus, bus. And of course, not to us. Um, of course, what was achieved during the bus boycott was phenomenal. I mean, mm. Mrs. Rosa Parks and Dr. King and the and the thousands of people, black people in Montgomery in the 15, 55, 56, they, it was a tremendous turning point in the nation's history. But after all of that, segregation still persisted on in, in interstate travel. So Greyhound buses, trailways mm. buses, trains, airplanes, airports, train stations, those things were still segregated. So that's where the Freedom Rides come in, because they tried to tackle that, um, that issue, interstate travel. So yeah. we get to tell their story over. Excellent. That's what we do here at the museum. We tell the story of the more than 430 courageous individuals who risked their lives to change the way we get to travel as American citizens. Wonderful. You know, what's so interesting. <laughs> I was talking to Miss Walker and she. She shared with me. Let's give her some snaps. Absolutely. Let's, 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 let's Come on her, now. Let's give her Come some now. snaps, man. <laughs> I'm so proud of this young lady. I, I mean, I, I'm bubbling. Um, she 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 made uh, something clear to me. She said, we have to preserve this so that generations yet unborn, mm -hmm. right, will understand what took place and understand how their struggle is not new. It's mm -hmm. not a new struggle, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and they can, they're able to connect the dots. And so thank you for, for your commitments, Ms. Dorothy Walker. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I'm looking absolutely. forward to the discussion. I really, I, I'm looking forward to learning a lot. So. Absolutely. Well, well, me too. I'm, we're, we're, <laughs> we're, we're in the same boat. So we're talking about learning a lot. I learned a lot from this next person we're about to bring up, Dr. Mm. Julianne Malvo. Okay. Let me tell you something. Uh, if you're talking about a dynamic person who just lights up a room, it's Dr. Julianne Malvo. She's the Dean of the College of Ethnic Studies at California State University. And, uh, you know, she's an economist. So she, she knows how uh, money and, and, and economy uh, are distinguished. It's a difference between having money and having an economy. And so, <laughs> so, so she's clear that uh, having an economy shapes the lives. It shapes the possibilities. It, it influences the quality of life for people. And until we deal with that part, no civil rights movement can ever really be fully realized mm. until we deal with the issue of economic disparities in this country. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming a dear <laughs> friend, Dr. Julianne Malvo. Come on, put those snaps together. Welcome to the cutting edge. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, un un unmute, unmute you. Unmute. You. There we go. As Omar knows, I'm very rarely ever muted. So uh, <laughs> I know you from all the TV shows, all the all the national news programs is where I got my news and you were helping to interpret the complexities 
of the world then. And it's even more so now. Yeah. What, a, what an opportunity for your voice to be heard. You know, I could talk, we could talk all, all day about you, uh, Dr. Malvo, <laughs> but I, would you just please tell people who you are? Well, I am Dr. Julianne Malvo. I'm a San Francisco native, uh, resident of Washington, D.C. for the past 25 years, the inaugural dean of the College of Ethnic Studies here at Cal State LA. We are on the second College of Ethnic Studies in um, the country. I mean, other people have the departments of ethnic studies or, you know, Pan African Studies departments. We are under my umbrella. I have Pan African Studies, Chicano Latino Studies, Asian Asian American Studies, and the delightful opportunity to hire a tenured professor of American Indian Studies, um, which All is right. the fourth department. And That's I wonderful. <laughs> Come on now. That's <laughs> wonderful. That's fabulous. I've Absolutely. Of people who work with me, an associate dean who's a Chicana sister, who's really good. Um, all of my people are great. Our uh, Melina Abdullah is one of the founders of Black Lives Matter LA, and she's also one of my professors in Pan African Studies. So I feel very blessed and profoundly favored to be in this position. I didn't go looking for it. I came to California because my mama was ill mm. and I wanted to be closer to home. And um, before I even got the position, unfortunately, she made her transition. But I was here. And since I'm here, we're going to do our best to basically talk about higher education, not as usual, but higher education unusual. Okay. And I, we have to look at the stories that we tell. They're not stories. They're history. And people always talk about, is this the truth or not the truth? I look forward to, uh, I just sent Terry Ann Scott a note saying, send me your book. Because <laughs> I actually have a radio program. I don't, as you know, Brother Omar, if you have airtime, you don't give it up. So I have a radio program in D.C. <laughs> that airs every Monday at 9 a.m. Eastern time, which means I'm rolling out the bed at 4, getting ready for my show. Mm -hmm. But the lynching piece that she's working on, I really mm. want to know more about. One of the things I work on is the whole connection between the wealth gap and lynching. See, a lot of people think that lynching was about black men raping white women. B.S. Most lynchings were about something economic, mm. property, about somebody wanting somebody's property and figuring out a way to take it. The first lynching that Ida B. Wells documented was a lynching of Tommy Moss and two of his friends. And here's what happened. Well, y'all cut me off. I talk too long because Omar. Knows uh, uh, you know, hold up. You know, I, we, you, we know how to do this. You, we, we, we like you. Just we want you to wax eloquent <laughs> like you always do. So just go on and be yourself, my sister. Well, go ahead. I mean, well, so there was a store in Memphis, Tennessee, in an area called The Curve that was owned by a white man who was despicable. Uh, sisters would go in there to buy things. People would talk under their clothes. He had 10 citations for alcohol use. This was in the 1880s when you were not supposed to, you know, alcohol was not what you did. Um, so, so anyway, Tommy Moss and two of his friends said, we're going to start our own store. They started the People's uh, Grocery Store. The People's Grocery Store welcomed Black people, and so Black women went there. The white man was mad because it was taking away his business. In fact, his mind was, how dare these black people start a store to compete with me? Two mm. little boys got into a fight over some marbles. White men went to the black store to resolve the marbles fight. Hello. They had guns, but guess what? The brothers had guns too. So uh, there was a showdown and a white man got shot. He wasn't killed, he was shot. The next day, the white people went back and arrested Tommy Moss, who was an exemplary black man. He had been a postmaster. He was a deacon in his church. Um, he was a father of two. He was amazing. They went and arrested Tommy and his two friends and then lynched them. Um, wow. Ida B. Wells documented that. But even more than lynching them, then the white man got the store for eight cents on the dollar. <clears throat> so see, this was about economic competition. This was not about white, um, black men raping white women. So same is that the same? Is that the same thing with uh, Black Wall Street or, or? Oh yeah, no, no, no. In Black Wall Street, uh, Dick Rowland, nineteen-year-old black man who was a a, a shoe shine boy, only place he could use the restroom was on the top of a building, a six-floor building. Sarah Page, white woman, seventeen, and there's some evidence that they may have known each other. There was a, a group of orphans. They were both orphans who hung out in the evening in um, Tulsa. 
But anyway, somehow he jostled her. And you know, those elevators from back in the day, they weren't like our elevators. You know, they might land kind of crooked. He jostled her. She exclaimed, some say she screamed, whatever. A white man saw the interaction and went and to the sheriff and said, Dick Rowland raped Sarah Page. The newspaper then had a headline that said to lynch a Negro tonight. And they white men headed down to the sheriff's office with their guns. But the brothers, this was 1921, post-World War I, brothers had guns too. So they went down with their guns because they're like, they're not going to lynch this brother on our watch. Mm. So what ended up happening with that is that the white people got so ex ex exercised about this that they went and tore up Black Wall Street. They said that Black men were arming themselves for them. Now, if you understand Tulsa, Oklahoma, 1921, we had everything. Mm. Everything but a bank. We had a department store. We had a movie theater. We had the first person to own an automobile in Tulsa was a Black man who then figured out how to repair autos. So he had an automobile repair shop that the white people even had to go to because there wasn't anybody else. So, you know, we when when after Black Wall Street was, was eviscerated, the governor of Oklahoma set up a commission, no black people on it, that asked what was the per what happened? Why did this happen? The response in an official document was too many N words have too much money. And N words was not Negroes. In an official right. document, too many N words have too much money. Again, economic envy. Economic envy was the driver, and it was also about economic terror. Because Richard Wright wrote when a lynching happens in Alabama, we feel it in Chicago. In other words, this is a possibility that all black men, especially, but also mm. black women. If I mm. could have just another minute, let me talk about the lynching of Mary Turner, a black woman who was 19 years old, 19 years old. A man, a white man named Hampton Smith, basically kept his plantation going by bailing brothers out of jail. When he bailed them out of jail, he never told them I bailed you out of jail, so you got to work for me for a month. It was time undetermined. He beat the you know what out of a brother named Sidney Johnson to the point I think Sidney probably lost his mind. He beat him with a rifle butt because he was sick. He anyway, Sidney killed the MF. Excuse me, Omar. Yeah, I know you're a Christian. And yeah, that's yeah, right. Him. That's why I said MF. He, but he killed him, and he shot his wife, winged her. For the next two weeks in Valdosta, Georgia, they lynched a brother every day. Mary Turner, her husband's name was uh, Hazel. He was lynched. She went to the courthouse and said, someone has to account for the lynching of my husband. She was 19, she was pregnant. They said that she was insolent and mouthy. Now my sisters on this call know, if, if, if insolent and mouthy, we all insolent and mouthy. We all would have been lynched back then. Um, but anyway, she went there to, to make them accountable. They tied her up by her ankles. They poured gasoline on her skirt. They hung her upside down, and lit her on fire. She wow. expelled her fetus and they stomped it. And no one has ever had to pay account for it. They have finally, thank you to Brian Stevens and others. Uh, there's a, mon there's a, a marker of her lynching. But again, this was about white people trying to, first of all, intimidate black people, but secondly, appropriate our labor. So again, lynching was not about rape that they would like to say. It was about um, big economics. One more story, if I might. Alexander Manley was the editor of a newspaper in Wilmington, North Carolina. Ma uh, Wilmington, as you know, was a spot of white folks just went butt wild crazy because black people were self-determining. In Wilmington, black men on the docks earned the same amount of money as white people did. There were black police officers. A Republican governor, Republicans were the good guys then, a Republican governor was elected because of the black vote. So then these people systematically, they would have called the red shirts, and the red shirts were the, the followers of the Klan. The red shirts basically systematically tried to take away the black vote. But Alexander Manley wrote an article that said that there were consensual relationships between black men and white women. He wrote that down. White folks were incensed. They were the first 
woman senator. First woman senator was a woman named Rebecca Felton. And she wrote, if we have to lynch 1,000 Negroes per day to, pers to preserve white women's purity, we'll do it. Manly responded by saying, if you see a comely uh, white woman and a handsome black man, maybe they're in a consensual relationship. Now, you know white folks went crazy about that. Manly had to leave, but in Wilmington, the day before an election, they rounded up the most prominent black men, put them on a train with tickets, one-way tickets. They had to lose, lose all their property. And they went door to door to take people's property, take their homes. The number of black owned businesses went down by a third. So don't let anybody fool you into thinking that lynching is about sex. Lynching is about white people wanting control over black dollars. Right. Let me, let me ask right. this question um, to, uh, and then I'm go to uh, Dorothy Walker, but uh, Dr. Scott, help, help me out because we talked about women have always stood up to systems. Mm -hmm. um, they, they've stood up for their sons. They stood up for their husbands. They, they stood up for their brothers, their uncles. They've always stood up, even at the expense of their own lives, mm -hmm. right? Talk, talk a little bit about how the connectivity of the strength of women and preserving our rights now, how, how that uh, intersects. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of places we can go with that. Can I can I say something to what Dr. Malvo was saying? Uh, you can say well? anything you want. You, <laughs> okay, you, and then you, I want to say you, you, you at home. I just <laughs> want right. you to know when you talk, we, we, we go. We, in, in, you know, Doc, Dr. Malvo just lit the yeah. fuse. I mean, so, yeah. so you know, let's go on and let it go. Absolutely. No, I think what she said was every single thing was exactly on point. That's right. The thing that we are typically taught. And the popular narrative of the time was that this is protecting white womanhood. When those who were lynching African American men, in particular, knew that that's not what it was what it was about. Frederick Douglass said, "Black progress is what is causing lynching. Black progress is what is making white folks take off the masks and be able to lynch without any fear of retribution, and then add this leisure element to it and take corporal souvenirs, have postcards, because there was no shame in it." The black body became codified. And why do we see that? Because that economic progress that was brought on after reconstruction or during reconstruction after the civil war, that was considered criminalized. And that becomes relevant to today. How is that? If we think about crime. So before the civil war, black bodies, you were castrated, mm. black people, their ears may have been boxed, whatever it was that would punish them, it often stopped short of death. Why did it stop short of death? Because there's a monetary value on the body of that individual. After Reconstruction or after the Civil War, then that no longer was at play. So lynching became this form of, so of social control, of racialized terror. So when you add economics into that, crime changes. If we think about a crime today, we think murder, things that are standard crimes. But what becomes criminalized then? What becomes criminalized then is owning a successful grocery store, mm. speaking out against a white family, migrating into an area and opening a business. And so there's this patrolling of black of racial boundaries that occurs that we see today. Why was Ahmaud Arbery lynched? He was lynched because he was running in a white neighborhood. That was his crime. And so there's this conflation of blackness and criminality that lingers into today. Now, when we think about, for instance, a resistance to that and a resilience, and we bring black women into this, they have always been this backbone in the community, even in the moments after the Civil War when Black women did not have the right to vote. Black men were extended the right to vote with the first Reconstruction Act in 1867, and then it's solidified in the 15th Amendment before it's taken away by racial terror and literacy tests after, this, after the Union soldiers leave the South in 1877. But women accompanied men to the polls. Women oversaw what men were doing. They were partners mm. in this political expression. Mm. So just because they didn't have the right to vote, it didn't mean that Black women didn't exercise their right to vote in this kind of proxy manner. And so nothing has changed in that regard. Black women have always been, whether it was behind the scenes or right there in your face, the strength. We see that when we talk about the modern civil rights movement, Black women were instrumental to this movement. It just so happens that so much that has come out that has been written, and that's been changed in the last few decades. Yes. We're starting now to see the names like Septima Clark and Ella Baker. But before that, 
they were erased from the historical record in many ways, even though their strength is what started things. Ella Baker was the, the driving force be behind the, the creation of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, mm -hmm. one of the most prominent and effective organizations of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow. wow. That's, that's powerful. You know, um, Ms. Walker, you know, this, this notion of the freedom rides and the, and the, and the interstate commerce and, and being able to integrate places that went from state to state, right? That's, that was, that was the piece on, on the difference between the, the bus boycott and the freedom rides. It, it, bus boycott was dealing with local issues Freedom Ride was dealing with interstate issues. I, I want you to kind of give us some history of the of the uh, Freedom Riders, and 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 then I want you to uh, integrate women in their role into that space. Well, I let me just start out by saying Amen to Dr. Malvo <laughs> and Dr. Scott. I just had to say Amen. <laughs> Y'all got the spirit moving up in here. <laughs> um. But to bridge what they were saying and what is, you know, talk, let's talk about the women. And, and that's one of the things that I love to talk about in terms of this history, because um, a lot of people come to Montgomery, as I said earlier, knowing about the courageous Mrs. Rosa Parks, um, not, not really casting her in the activist role that she was, um, and, and, but knowing at least something about her story. Um, but a lot of, you know, the overwhelming majority of people, and that is not an overstatement. Um, the overwhelming majority of people who come to um, the city, who come to the state, who come to the, our museum have never heard the name Irene Morgan before. Mm. And that's unfortunate um, because 11 years before Mrs. Parks took that courageous stand on a city bus in downtown Montgomery, Irene Morgan took it on a Greyhound bus in Virginia in 1944. Um, and, and the differences between the two are, are you know, there are similarities, but there are differences. You know, Mrs. Morgan at the time did not consider herself to be an activist. Um, she certainly, I'm sure, had, um, had, had had been involved in or at least supported activism, but that wasn't her goal. Her goal on the night she's arrested is to get from Virginia to Maryland. Mm. Um, she was not well. She had gone down to Virginia. Her family lived in Virginia in Gloucester, Gloucester, Gloucester County, and she had gone down there to recover from an from a um, an illness from not an illness but from a, a medical procedure uh, or a medical issue that had happened to her a very serious one, and here she is just trying to get back home, and this bus fills up in the middle of the night. She's gotten on it. She's sitting where she's supposed to be sitting. So there are the similarities where to Mrs. Parks' case, um, she's sitting in the segregated section of the bus, but the bus takes on new passengers. It's the middle of the night in the middle of nowhere, Virginia, Saluda, Virginia. Mm. And this bus driver says to her, you know, you have to give up your seat. Now, this is what we always kind of try to tell people about the difference between the bus boycott and the Freedom Ride story, Miss Morgan's story and Miss Parks. Black people, particularly black women in, in Montgomery, had been subjected to all kinds of horrible situations when it came to the buses. Um, and because they were the ones who were mostly using the buses. Um, and so they had people had been thrown off. People had gotten in confrontations with the bus drivers here in Montgomery. It was a horrible situation that the women were going through. And I'm gonna come back to that point in a minute. Mm -hmm. But but. Um, with Mrs. With Ms. Morgan, her this, this driver approaches her. As, so in, in Montgomery, let me flip back. My Montgomery, if people, these black women who were, who were treated so poorly on the Montgomery city buses, when they had to stand, it was a horrible situation because yes, they may have to stand 16, 18 blocks to get home. Montgomery wasn't as big as it is now. And that's a lot when you've been working all day, you've got kids dealing with, you're trying to get home and cook and clean and do all these other domestic duties that women had to do. That's a lot. But if you're on a bus going from Virginia to Maryland, well, you know, from from Gloucester County, Virginia to Maryland, how might how long might you have to stand? And mm -hmm. here's a person who is not well being asked to do that. So I think in her mind, she just Miss Morgan was like, you know what? 
I can't, I'm not going to move. I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to give up my seat and I'm not going to stand for hours and hours and hours when I've paid my fare. And, you know, this isn't right. So Ms. Parks, when she's arrested, and I, obviously no one should be manhandling women, um, but when she's arrested, there is no manhandling. With Ms. Morgan, she is physically dragged off this bus, dragged off this bus, kicking and screaming. Um, and, um, and I think her, her reaction is fear. It's the middle of the night in the middle of nowhere. They don't, she doesn't know what's going to happen to her when they get her off that bus, but you better believe they work for it. Um, and mm -hmm. they, they charge her with resisting arrest. They charge her with violating the segregation laws. And that's when she turned on that activism. And she reached out to the NAACP. They took her case. It goes all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, 10 years before they ruled that segregated bus seating in Montgomery was uh, unconstitutional, they ruled in her favor, in Ms. Morgan's favor, hmm. that segregating passengers on interstate buses was unconstitutional. And so, like I said, it's a lot of that is people don't know that story. Um, hmm. It was a major case. And let me tell you one of the reasons why it's a major case. Because if you go in any museum in the country and you start to see, the, and this goes back to some of the things that Dr. Scott and Dr. Malvo say, if you start to see what Black people are charged with after 1946, after that ruling, it's, not, it's no longer charging them with violating segregation laws. It's now resisting arrest, dis creating a disturbance breach of peace. There are all these creative things that now come up in terms of charges. So her case really sets a precedent. It's a landmark mm. ruling. And unfortunately, she doesn't like, again, most people don't know her story. Yeah. But let's let's flip back to Montgomery again. So bus boycott. Mrs. Parks is arrested on a Thursday, right? I'm, uh, I'm sorry. Yes. Mrs. Parks is arrested on a Thursday. There's a full fledged movement by Monday. How does that even happen? How do you go from an arrest on a Thursday to a full-fledged movement on a, on, a, on a Monday? That's because there was a plan already in place. Okay. And the Women's Political Council had that plan. They have been waiting. They have been gone, gone to, to the men, to, <laughs> to the ministers and said, we need to do something about the buses. Well, the men never did act on that plan, but it was ready. They were ready to pull the trigger whenever the men said, okay, we're in. <laughs> whenever Edie Nixon and, and um, they got together, they, she was like, okay. So when when that when Mrs. Parks was arrested and, and, and that trigger got pulled, all they had to do is is go to action. So they, they activated. They, there we they go. Activated. Mm -hmm. They activated. It was Joanne Robinson, a professor at Alabama State University, who contacted, the, got her students over there. They ran off the flyers, dispersed them through the community. It was the women. <laughs> okay. The political council. So, um, so, and it was, and, and I'm gonna flip back to Ms. Morgan just for one more second. So after Mrs. Morgan is arrested, Morgan versus Virginia, and the case, and the case is settled by the Supreme Court, the Congress of Racial Equality decides, you know what, we're gonna take a journey across the Upper South. It's too dangerous to go down Lower South, but we're gonna. Go go through the upper south and we're going to test these buses and see if they're going to comply with this ruling mm. and you know what they said oh but it's too dangerous to have women involved in the testing now this is based on the case of a woman who who resisted who gave who who put the started this who put everything in motion but now it's too it's too dangerous to have women involved so women had to fight on two fronts they're yeah. having to fight outside the movement but they're also having to fight for recognition in that same equality inside the movement and i think that's some of the the narrative that people lose when they're talking about what happened during that during the that movement during the time in the 50s and 60s so that's how we try to break down the complexity about Okay, the women have always been at the forefront, and like, and then like Dr. Scott said, behind they weren't just behind the scenes; they were making all the plans. The women, the men were out front executing, but it was the planning. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, the they had they had to fight for the right to fight, man. Good <laughs> precious of life. Go ahead, Dr. Malvo, Dr. T, Dr. Malvo, what were you saying? When I was president of Bennett College, my theme for my students was history belongs to she who holds the pen, because all too often. My brothers, who I love very much, sideline us. Does everybody knows the story of the Greensboro Four? Those four A and T black men, North Carolina A and T State University black men who sat at the lunch counters. What people don't know is the role of Dr. Willoughby Player, who was the first woman president of Bennett College, who empowered her students to be activists. And what she did was took their homework to the jails. Now, patriarchy being what it is, 
The brothers did not want the crazy white people throwing ketchup and stuff on the sisters, but the entire thing was planned on the Bennett College campus. Why? Because a and is a state university. Their state appropriation would have been jeopardized had it be clear that they were doing the work about protests. The first uh, address that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. did in North Carolina was at where? Bennett College. Why? He couldn't speak at A&T. He could speak at Bennett because we're a private, small private university. Where the brothers of A&T, many veterans, went and got him at the airport, brought him to the college. The, the chapel overflowed with people. There's only supposed to hold 1,200. Oral history says there were 2,500 people there sitting on laps, sitting in the balconies, everything else. But the bigger piece of the story is that those sisters were there. And that's a history that people would like to sideline, that those sisters were every step of the way. Right. Um, right. You know, part of it was male patriarchy, but part of it was just, we don't see women when we do the work. People are very inclined to say we weren't there, but you know what? Hell yeah, we were there. Not only were we there, <laughs> we were the facilitators of it. But we right. didn't see the lunch counters, but we were in the Woolworths and we got arrested. Right. That's one of the reasons why we wanted to do this show today, <laughs> and we wanted we wanted to bring the fire. And I guess y'all, <laughs> we 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 were not we as, as they say down south, we ain't playing. Okay, right. <laughs> you know, let me say that. Let, let, let's do this. Let's get a pulse of uh, where, where people are. We, we know that uh, each and every week we try to get a pulse of what you're feeling now. So uh, go to the chat and just put in whatever word that describes how you feel at this moment. Don't overthink it. And you can put as many words in as you want. We're going to um, at the end, we're going to put up what we call a word cloud to kind of see what we feel like collectively. So we got people behind the scenes that will uh, curate that for us and put those things in. For those people who are watching uh, via Facebook, just uh, put into the uh, messenger area or the chat area. Uh, just put whatever you are thinking, whatever you are feeling. Now we want to we want to hear and to feel what you feeling, and and uh, and 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 see how do we collectively feel. You know, now, Mayor, uh, Mayor, go 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 ahead, Doc. I, I mean, yeah. I'm just saying, I, I got to just step back and and recognize what just happened here on the cutting edge. Okay, we've had this show, and each time we get to a whole new level of conversation, the knowledge that was just dropped is amazing, and mm -hmm. so. And so now we have a now we have a way of communicating to our to our community using these platforms. And as we move along, I'd like to hear your thoughts about how we do that and what silver linings might exist exposed by the pandemic that we need to really fight for. Mm -hmm. So keep those words coming. They'll let yep. us know when that cloud is ready. You know, I often wonder, you know, everybody here has a history uh, background in some kind of way, right? And I want to know, what do you think, or why do you think the current power structure is so uh, afraid of the history or telling accurate history? Why, why, why is that? Dr. Scott, help me out. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to do exactly what I did last time and add something to the last conversation and then come up to that question. Does that sound okay, like you, 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 I, I, you know what, Dr. Dr. Scott, Dr. Scott, <laughs> you can do you. That's what all I'm right. Saying. Is I <laughs> love do... hearing this discussion of, of women in the movement. And one way I want to make sure that we bring in all of these women in the movement is to think about the modern civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s as one monumental episode in a historical continuum of struggle. So these were not the first moments. I think about, for instance, Elizabeth Jennings, who did not give up her seat on a streetcar in New York City mm. in 18, 1854, over 100 years previous to this. And so these courageous, incredible women of this modern movement are standing then on the shoulders or being influenced by these other women, the, the washerwomen of Atlanta, who in the late 1800s waged a boycott to make sure to increase their wages. And so we have to understand that these moments that happen in this modern civil rights movement, and this is what 
Children are taught, if they're taught anything, this is the first time that anyone resisted. These are not the first moments that we have been resisting this kind of oppression, this kind of system since the first ships left the Western shores of Africa before the Middle Passage. And that women have often been at the forefront of so much of this like transportation equity. Every, almost every single case that we see that has had some outcome where we are dismantling Jim Crow, a woman was at the forefront of that, a black woman. And my light went off for some reason. So no, a little bit dark. You know, no, you, you, your light shine is so, so bright. Oh, light yes. I don't oh, really yeah. need it. You know, you, you, you. The, the, the knowledge you through. drop is so bright. The light say, I, you, I'm just going to sit back and watch. <laughs> like. <laughs> well, I'll take that. Thank you. And then can you, since I got off on that, remind me again, ask me the question that you had just No, posed. No, I just wanted, you know, right now people are talking about they, they don't want history to oh. be shared. In fact, in Florida, they're mm -hmm. saying that teachers, if they make students feel uncomfortable, they mm -hmm. can literally be, you know, reprimanded, mm -hmm. right? Uh, parents can literally sue them for mm -hmm. making people, what, what is this fear of knowing the history as it existed? That is a reestablishment of white supremacy, clear and simple. That's what that is. We are not able to sidestep that. That is a way to take the onus off of a white power structure that historically has disenfranchised and disempowered African-Americans and say anything that we have today, if you have been redlined, if you haven't been able to acquire generational wealth, that's your fault, not structural inequality. And that's absolutely false. And so these efforts to codify, because let's be real, they're already not teaching much black history in schools, right? Most students aren't exposed to it unless they are by their parents or once they get to college. But the effort to then illegalize the teaching of it is tantamount to, is aligned with the reestablishment of white supremacy. I have just, I was commissioned by our local school district to create a class on African-American studies. So at least some school districts are moving forward while others are going backwards. But this is going to be an elective. We have a school board meeting on March 26, and I've had to call out the troops, the allies to come and support that because there is a growing sentiment of individuals who don't want that. This is just an elective. If you don't want your kids to take it, don't take it. But what does true history do? It forces people to reconcile sometimes with their own privilege, number one. And number two, it, it allows people to, it, they say it makes white children uncomfortable. What does it do to black children? What does it do to black children to say, we can't talk about this. Your history doesn't matter, whether it's the triumph or the challenges, whatever is going on today, we're not going to talk about that. And so really plain and simple, this is much about a reestablishment of white supremacy. There's no, no uh, surprise that it comes after this Trump regime and this reemergence of very visible racism. But the thing that we need to understand is we are not powerless in this, that our voices can be heard when we show up at the school board meetings, when we go to the teachers, mm -hmm. when we push against it, when we go to the polls, we have power to stop that. If we can make sure that all of us can move freely in the public realm like we do, and we weren't able to do that then, that we can establish these new paradigms, they can't stop us now. We can change yeah. this. You know, you know, you you mentioned something, and 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 uh, Dr. Malvo, I know you 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 really want to get in, and I'm gonna give you a chance to do that. <laughs> but I want to know when did white supremacy dissipate? It never. When did it, white it privilege did. dissipate? It's always talking about the reestablishment, Dr. Scott. I I never. They, it never left. No, right? it just it ebbs. It, it goes into hiding a little bit, and then shows its face. Right. Okay. Go ahead. There have been moments moments of sunlight, but white supremacy is baked into the cake that is called America. I mean, basically, if you want to slice it, you say you want to take some out the cake, you can't take white supremacy out of the cake that's called America because it is fundamental in this country. But in terms of what Sister uh, Dr. Scott was saying about critical race theory and our teaching is I want to first lift up a case. Here in uh, San Diego, California, an ignorant white woman chose to read a poem they use the word, the N word, to fourth graders, to fourth graders. And she said she wanted them to understand how people felt when they heard the N word. Now, the poem was a poem, it was either a Langston Hughes or County Cullen. And it was, I, I spent some time in Baltimore. Y'all know the poem, it's a very short poem. But he says, I was a little boy, a white boy, not a whit bigger. I smiled at him and then he called me in. 
of all the time in Baltimore from May until December, this is the only thing that I remember. And I'm paraphrasing the phone, poem some. But when this stupid woman read the poem, two 10-year-olds, they're my heroes, two 10-year-olds got up and walked out, went to the principal's office mm -hmm. and said, we don't have to hear that. Two 10-year-olds. And that means their mamas and daddies were teaching them what they were going to hear and what they were not going to hear. Now, so I'm saying if 10 year olds have that much agency, how much agency must we have? I mean, if 10 year olds understood that this was unacceptable, then what must we do to be clear about what is unacceptable? So Dr. 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 Malbo, let me push back a little bit. And, and uh, it's difficult for me to do that uh, to you, but you know, just allow me to do it uh, just this I'm time. Gonna you, I'm gonna give you a second, just cause it's- You know, I know, I know you, I know you are. That's, we, that's, that's our friendship going on. <laughs> Let me say this. So, so if 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 it made black people feel uncomfortable, isn't that the same thing as if white people feel uncomfortable with other kinds of things? Wouldn't that be the same thing? Wouldn't that be kind of validating their position? No, because tell me, tell me to differentiate for me. I just want to. Oh, I just okay. want to know. Nobody should use the N word, but black folks when they in the bed with they boo. That's the only time <laughs> we should be. Well, well, you, well, you know, that's not the same. It's 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 in our music. It's in well, it's in every every part of of of, of our culture. White people should not feel free to be throwing the N word around. But even more than that, what I'm saying about this is that the whole issue of comfort is very fungible. Tulsa, Oklahoma, was the first state to pass a law that said you could not make people feel uncomfortable. And my response to that was, how the hell you think people felt when their homes were being burnt down? How you think they felt when they didn't have anything anymore? So don't give me the comfort story. The reason that that white woman is on suspension and should be fired is because she should have known better. There's this thing called context. Reverend Jackson always says content without context is pretext. Let me repeat that. Content without context is pretext. So if you if you read that poem to 10th graders, I and if you did it with a with a pretext where you start out and say, this is why I'm doing this, fine. Okay. I got it. I understand that. Yeah, you you made you made yourself clear when you went to Jesse Jackson, you you made yourself you made yourself clear. You 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 brought it home. Merry Christmas, uh, Dr. Malvo. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> I chair push Excel, which is an education arm of the National Rainbow Coalition. And in chairing that, I've had the opportunity to deal with all kinds of educators around the country. There are some two young people who are advisors, they're high school students who are advisors to the Illinois Board of Education, a white girl and a black guy. And the white girl said that she was disturbed that she had never been taught history. She said, these things are required, these things are required. Why is our history not required? And so our history must be required and we must demand that it be required. And it's not about Dr. Scott creating a class. It's about this stuff needing to be integrated into all of our classes. I think back and I know I'm older than dirt, certainly older than you, not older than <laughs> you, older than dirt. And, uh, <laughs> and so I recall my fifth grade textbook, mm. I recall that there were two black people in the textbook. One looked like they had escaped from an Uncle Ben's rice box. And other one looked like uh, Aunt Jemima's second cousin. And I, I went to Catholic school. The book was like about a 500 page book, two black people in it. And there was a section, they said, and the slaves were very happy. So, you know, I was sent home that day because I called the nun a uh, MF liar. Well, I no, no, hold up, hold up. You didn't call the nun that did you, Dr. Malvo. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you, I, yeah, you did. <laughs> <laughs> and then after my mom hit me upside the head for using the profanity, she walked <laughs> over to the school and said, why would you tell my child the slaves were happy? Uh, <laughs> but this is the myth. This is the mythology. What W.B. Du Bois said about, he, just, he said you had to surround black people with lies in order to assert white supremacy. So the lies were that we were lazy, how could they say we were lazy? <laughs> they would have plantations without us. The lies were that, you know, we were stupid, but they had laws that prevented us from reading. North Carolina, to teach a slave to read is to excite dissatisfaction to the detriment of the general population. 
That's a line that I opened up with when I did my inaugural address as president of Bennett College to talk about why our, our reading was always what we were about. And how dare anybody tell a lie that we didn't want to read? In North Carolina, if you taught an enslaved person to read, you could be fined, you could be whipped 40 times if you were black or fined $200, which today would be like $10,000 if you were white. Excuse me? So, but what Du Bois said is if you surround black people with a lie, it essentially asserts white supremacy. So basically what we're doing now, because so many more of us have microphones like you and others, so many more of us are assertive because we're out there in the public square, as Dr. Scott has said, is that we're basically tearing those walls down. And what we're getting when we tear the walls down is resistance. We're getting people to say, uh-uh, that's not what happened. So this resistance that we're seeing is a total function of the fact that people cannot live with the truth and they want to reassert the lie. You know, some, one of the things that um, you talked about, Brian Stevenson, he's right there down there with you as well, uh, Ms. Walker. And uh, Dr. Terry uh, Ann Scott, it's like that's down your belly wick. I mean, that's just yeah. right down your, your alley. Uh, so so the, the notion of, of understanding the brutality, was, was, was this public brutality a deterrent to other people or what was it exactly? Uh, Dr. Scott, help me out. You know, when you, when you make public lynching, what, what is that to say, don't do this because this will be your fate? Uh, well, that's part of it indeed. So when I was talking about earlier, this revised notion of crime, that's what it is. It becomes this form of social control where you, most people who were lynched before the civil war or immediately after were white folks. They were lynched by small groups of mass people who did not want to get in trouble. They were lynched for things like horse theft, et cetera. They were not burned to death the way that black people were burned to death. Their bodies were not turned into souvenirs. There were not other modes of fanfare taken from them. So now when you have in this new society, as Dr. Malvo was talking about economic progress, black migration, black, black and white uh, towns. So people are moving to these towns and cities. In my book, I talk about how that migration is stands in step with an increase in lynchings because of housing competition, because of job competition, because of black progress very specifically. Then you start to see lynching become a form of racial terror. It was one, it was a very massive visible one, form of racial control and racial terror. It also fell in line with this increased notion of the black body as a part of popular culture. So at the same time that you have lynchings, you have also the mammy little salt shakers and things coming out. You have postcards of black babies uh, being eaten, pretend eaten by alligators. And so you have black bodies becoming a form of entertainment. So lynching fell in line both with that form of black people in misrepresentation of popular material culture, as well as a way to control how they function and to control their progress. Wow. And so the terror that the EJI brings forth, one of the skillful things that they do, and if people have not gone to the mass incarceration, the Legacy Museum, they should, this is not a disconnected past from today. There are through lines between this kind of racial terror in the post-emancipation era and mass incarceration today. And Jim Crow and all of these things in between, they're all connected. It is no surprise, it is no coincidence that in districts where you have the highest rates of black people being put to death or being sentenced to death also had the highest rates of lynching. And they are specific to acts that were committed against the white body. Black men in particular are more likely to get the death sentence if the crime that they committed is going against the, black, uh, the white body. And so if anyone has not been to the Legacy Museum, they should go. The other thing that the Legacy Museum does, and this is what I am all about, this is what, uh, soon I'll be director of a new institute called the Institute for Common Power, where we do education to action. The Legacy Museum says, what next? And so before you exit there, it says, this is what you can do to make a difference in your local communities. Wow, wow. that's powerful. Wow. Ms. Walker, um, you know, we talked about um, George Floyd, and um, I want you to take us back to uh, the Freedom Riders and uh, when they came into Montgomery. And, and one of the things is that it was a kind of complicity of law enforcement with local people um, 
that allowed them to beat the uh, Freedom Riders. Talk a little bit about, you know, that piece and, and how that manifests itself. Well, and, 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 and along the way, say something about the courage it took well, to stand I'm, up. Yeah, get absolutely. out of my head. Get out of my head. I was going right there. <laughs> <laughs> but I was also going to take a I was going to take a page from Dr. Scott's playbook and 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 sort of chime in on a f- couple of other pieces. Go ahead. No, you can do that. that. Absolutely. Go You're ahead. In the shop. You're in the shop. Um, and and particularly Dr. Malvo's piece of the economics and, mm. and history. And and I think the economics is a part of history that people don't really think about all that well. And we we think about that a lot here with the Freedom Rides because, and it, there are parallels to today when you look at it, because one of the things when the Freedom Riders decide to take this journey um, in, in 1961, so 14 years or 15 years after the Supreme Court had ruled that segregated seating on interstate con- tra- um, transit was unconstitutional, the Freedom Rides start. And it's six years after the the five years after the bus boycott ends here in Montgomery. Um, The economics, let's go back to the economics of this. You know, starting in 19, well, we could go all the way back to Plessy in 1896 and all of that, you know, but coming forward between 1896 and and, and 1944, when Mrs. Morgan is arrested in the 1946 decision, you like, like Dr. Scott said, you had people who had who had stood up and who had tried to go through the court system to get regress for these issues of segregation still being enforced in interstate transportation. And there have been, there have been cases after case. In 1952, there's the case of Sarah Louise Keys. If, um, if people haven't heard her name, look her up. She was um, a private in the army wearing her uniform. She traveled from New Jersey to North Carolina. Her, her father told her before she left home, you know, sit as close as you can to the front, but obey the segregation laws as you get further south, wear your uniform so that people will see that you are a soldier. And, and she did that. She didn't cause any problems. She get in, she gets to, the bus gets to North Carolina and the bus driver takes a different approach in her case. He doesn't have her dragged off and arrested. He takes all everybody off that bus except for her and put them on a new bus. And then when she tries to get board that bus, then he has her arrested for creating a disturbance. Again, back to that Morgan decision. It's not going to be with not going to be charged with violating segregation. It's going to be she was creating a disturbance. So here she is being arrested in her uniform that she's serving her country. And yet she can't be she can't be allowed to travel as an American citizen, even when there's been a law that's been passed eight years before she took a seat on that bus that said she had the right to do that. And so she she doesn't go to the courts. The courts have already ruled. She goes to the federal government who regulate interstate travel. Buses, planes, and trains don't ride. They, there's not a company that can operate without federal uh, permitting. Um, so there's a permit process that they have to go through. They're regulated. And so the federal government had the will, had the ability to say bus companies, train companies, airplane companies, stop segregating. And they didn't do that. So the Interstate Commerce Commission, she went to them and said, basically, I'm being charged with violating segregation laws. That has been outlawed. Do something about it. And, you know, the, her, the rule, they, they did issue a ruling, the ICC in their, they, in their defense, they issued a ruling uh, two weeks before Mrs. Parks was arrested. They issue a ruling saying to these bus companies, you have six weeks to stop segregating. So what? Mm -hmm. (laughs) I mean, please, I guess that was the please don't segregate after six weeks. There's no there are no conditions. There's no if you don't do this, this is what will happen to you. So they just ignore it. And of course, the bus boycott starts and all of that. So when the Freedom Riders come in 1961, they are coming based on a case of Boynton versus Virginia, which is another case out of Virginia, but an Alabama boy, uh, Bruce Boynton, whose mother was on the bridge in 65. Amelia Boynton Robinson, my, so, my, my, my mentor. Absolutely. The Boynton family is just amazing. We need to have a whole show about that. Absolutely. But anyway, <laughs> um, so Boynton, uh, Bruce challenges this law and but bruce is a is a law school student at howard university so he knows the law he's being mentored by a third good marshal he knows the law but in 61 when the freedom riders decide to take this journey they're not going to the courts they're not they're not going back before the icc they said you know what we're going to disrupt the system we so we've tried the courts and we've won <laughs> but winning <laughs> 
still means segregation and it still means harassment. It still means we don't have the same comfort. So it still means terror could be possibly waiting for us down the road. So I tell you what, we're going to disrupt the system. And once you start disrupting the system, guess what? When buses start getting burned, people don't want to buy tickets to get on buses to go from here to there. They're going to talk. So their bus companies are then going to start losing money because of people not wanting to buy tickets because Buses are being burned because people want to exercise their constitutional right. So it becomes economics. And the same thing that happens when the ICC finally, after all these folks go to jail and all this happens over the freedom ride, finally the ICC comes back and says, well, you know what? Now we're going to levy a fine. F-I-N-E, we're going to fine you bus companies $100 a day per violation. If you do not, and, and this is the key, if you do not remove your segregated signs. Is that the same thing as saying integrate? I don't think so. It's no. saying take down the overt symbols of segregation out of the out of the public space. But even still, it is the economic fine that gets those signs start coming down. And that okay. in itself was a victory. So when you have that kind of, um, and then that's when people realize there's power in disrupting the system because you can go through the courts, you can continue to go through the courts and you can win your cases. But what does that translate to in terms of the reality of everyday Americans trying to travel across the country? And so that's, you know, that's, it's about the, it's always about the economics. If you, and, and let me just touch on one other thing that was said earlier about history and how it's being taught. Part of what I see that's been lost in teaching history is we don't teach local history. Mm. We teach, you can go in any classroom in this country and, and people will talk and will be teaching about almost any classroom, not me, not, I'm not gonna say everyone, but almost any of them. And they're talking about Dr. King and his role in history. That's important, absolutely. People should know that. But what about the people outside the door of that classroom? What about the people in that community? How long did it take people across the nation to know about Tulsa? How many kids in Tulsa didn't know about Tulsa? Mm -hmm. Okay. How, how do, if we teach our kids our local history, we have an opportunity to diversify it. So mm. I think, you know, yes, we're gonna we're gonna be teaching about you know the the things that happened during the Civil War and all these other things, but you're also gonna be talking about. Well, you know, during the Civil War, we had people from this community that signed up to be U.S. colored troops. Okay. So, I mean, you start to talk about the local heroes and it becomes more real, I think, to people when they can walk out the door and say, at that place, in this, in, at this date, your great grandfather did this. He was the first one to integrate the school that you're, that you're, you're sitting in right now mm. because they're not going to be taught that. They're not going to understand it unless they're taught. So they go through the whole school and say Brown versus Board of Education was an important decision in desegregating the school. But yet they don't know their grandfather's role. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we've got to we've got to figure out how to get back to teaching history from a local perspective, still making sure we're teaching the national history and the international history and the impact of it. But what about the local history? And that's when it comes down to the Freedom Rides. I mean, what happened here in Montgomery changed the trajectory of the Freedom Rides and it changed the trajectory of the civil rights movement. But it happened in a place in a local community where a lot of people still think they come to this bus station and still will ask, well, which which of these buses was Mrs. Parks on? They still don't know the difference. Mm -hmm, and so, mm -hmm. As long as we're not teaching the people in this community about, about where these places, where Mrs. Parks lived during the time and those communities that sustain the movement. If we're not teaching the people in this community about urban re removal, I'm, I'm excuse, excuse me, excuse me, <laughs> urban renewal, if we're not teaching them about Same you know, how the interstate came through <laughs> and, and tore, tore down these black communities and the black business districts disappearing, if we're not teaching them that, then how are they gonna know? They're gonna, they're gonna still think, well, the important history happened somewhere else. And yeah. or was done by somebody. Well, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, let me just say this, Mr. Mr. Mayor, I'm gonna make sure we want to make sure that this important history is is, is going to be talked about in like in the barbershops and even in the beauty salons. Yeah, I'm wondering, I'm wondering what the word cloud tells us and how it might shape the trajectory of this conversation. Yeah, let's see. Let's let's look. Let's look at the word cloud, and, and then uh, Dr. Melville, we're gonna come to you, and we also want you all to meet some people out there. Uh, uh, in in those shops. All right. Uh, you see, you, the most the most prominent word is empowered. 
Mm. More people said that than any other word. Yeah. And I think it's because of this truth that's resonating and, and just just being, you know, proliferated throughout this whole uh, evening. Thank you all so much for sharing your truth. I mean, the other words are so much smaller. It, it, I only have to say empowered is what people are, are feeling today. And they're empowered through knowledge. Mm. And, uh, and, and that's what I think. Uh, so, so wonderful. Uh, take that down because we got a couple of things we want to do. Uh, Dr. Melvo, you want to say something, gentlemen, introduce some people. Okay. Well, I want to respond and not really respond to <laughs> what Mr. Walker has said about local history. I mean, what I always tell people is you got history in your house. You got history in your attic. Okay. You have to talk to our elders about various and sundry things. I have a picture uh, in my office of my great grandmother. Her name was uh, Addie Hawkins. And the reason uh, the picture is power. She was a maid. And I always tell people she was a maid, so I didn't have to be one. Uh, she okay. sitting in, Lynch in Ames, Iowa, where from Mississippi, she migrated to serve a white family. And she married a Pullman porter who was a gambler. Uh, and she told the man that he had to bring her, her his money every week before she would marry him because he was a gambler. So she knew how much money he made. She's like, you can bring me your money so many weeks. And then, you know, I'll hook you up. And they did. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, my family. Oh, only you will put it like that, Dr. Malbo. Go, <laughs> Go ahead. But anyway, that picture reminds me of our history. Nobody would ever know, you know, we call her Mamu. No one would ever know her and nobody needs to. But what I know is that uh, I am a horrible, horrible house cleaner. I used to have a dust ball in my house. I called him Maceo. He got so tall. I was like, okay, dude, I'm going to go out with you because uh, that's how bad I am by house queen. But the deal on that is just that she did that work. So, uh, so I stand on her shoulders. Yeah. We all have someone in our history whose mm. shoulders we stand on. We all have someone in our community who is important to us. And we really need to lift that up. You're absolutely right, sis, that people are going to talk about Dr. King and Rosa Parks, and they're important. But Again, history belongs to she who holds the pen, whose stories are not being written, whose stories are not being told. You know, we talk about the, the Greensboro Four, where we lost our brother, Ron Walters, the professor at Howard University, yes. amazing black man. And he started a sit-in in Wichita, Kansas, or either, either Wichita or Topeka, long before the Greensboro Four. And we don't know that history. We don't know how many other sit-ins there were how many other young people stood up. So the challenge, Omar, to your listeners is to go and excavate your own history. Right. Who was it that made a difference to you? Who was it who was there when you couldn't, you know, before you even thought of, mm -hmm. you know, I had a, my mom had a friend, I, she used to get on my nerve. <laughs> uh, and she used to always say to me, I made a punch at your parents' wedding. I knew you before you were born. And I used to look at her out the side of my eyes and it took me to get older to really say, you know, you have a history in this community, baby girl. Don't act like when I ran for public office, my mom slapped a, a newspaper clipping at me. She was the first black person to testify before the Commission on the Status of Women in San Francisco in 1963. Um, I ran for public office in San Francisco, 1984. And what she said to me is you're not the only person in this family who, who <laughs> the platform. You're not the only one who has to talk in public. Lay, lay down your bona fides, mama. <laughs> lay it down. Hey, 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 let me go. I got to I got to do some stuff. You know, we got some people on. Let, let me bring up Dr. Carol Ritter. And, uh, you know, uh, doc, Dr. Ritter is an OBGYN uh, resident of the uh, Cutting Edge show. Uh, she is a a a wonderful person. I, I I she's been sitting back watching and listening to <laughs> to all of this stuff. As they say, knowledge being spit that spit out. Uh, to, <laughs> Gosh, <you know. laughs> yeah. What's, what's yes. your thoughts? So, <laughs> okay, uh, all you. I'm a gynecologist, and I've been empowering women, you know, my whole career. And I just want to let you know that you've empowered me tonight more than I ever expected to be because I thought I was an empowered woman, but their stories are just like, uh, need to be told. And I, I want to tell you a story that happened to me just today with a patient. Uh, she came in and, and this is like connecting the history stories to today. Okay. Um, 
it's a, a 70 year old white woman. And she said, Dr. Ritter, I was listening to NPR today and they had this story about maternal mortality. And she said, and I thought of you. And she said, I can't believe how many women die in childbirth in this country and it's going up. And I said, yes. And you know that um, that's not really fully true, that story, because white women are, childbirth is going down. It's black women, it, uh, death, ch ch death and white women. Okay. I'm like, I'm talking like nonsense, but you know what I mean? Black yeah, women right. dying in childbirth go up and white women dying in childbirth are, is going down. So she says, whoa, really? They didn't really say that. And I said, well, that's really what the statistics are showing. And they really haven't been col collecting these statistics consistently across our nation until 2018. So it's a history that hasn't been collected. And she said, well, why, why, why is that? I said, well, welcome to racism <laughs> in our healthcare system. Hmm. And she's like, I thought we were beyond that. I'm like, so yeah, so these stories, you know, are, are connecting and it, it, white people don't hear the lynching stories because it's really uncomfortable. But I've learned so much from uh, you two doctors here um, with the economics of it and, you know, the lynching before the Civil War and after the Civil War. That makes total sense why Black women are dying in childbirth, because it's a lynching of sorts. Right. Because wow. we just don't we don't take care of them. Right. We don't and care then, about them. And let me say that in these conversations that we're having, we're going back to other tables and other conversations. And with Dr. Ritter, she brings the state of Maryland's medical society who, who've been part of these kinds of discussions because it's, I believe in our healthcare delivery system that we have a solution space where we can really move the needle, you know, because the health disparities can be very compelling. And the pandemic is an opportunity to make sure that those resources that got right down to the neighborhood level you know, mm -hmm. the hyper local, that they don't just disappear after the surge. We got to push hard on that to make sure the resources continue to build the infrastructure that we know can work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I Let's add go. something to that? Oh, yeah. sorry. Were you going to go to yeah. No, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Doctor. I was yeah. going to say thank you, Dr. Ritter, for, for mentioning that about those health disparities and, and how real and problematic they are. And Mayor Neal, when you were asking earlier about Black women's role and kind of where we are and all of this, there's a modern role too that we often don't think about as for instance, the black mother and the things that we have to look out for today. I have three African-American daughters. My husband is black and I am always on high alert when they have to go either to the emergency room or looking for a doctor. For that reason, I'm hyper vigilant, vigilant about making sure that I'm there. Even though I have two of my daughters are in college now, I make sure that they communicate with me if they go to the doctor, because what I don't want is for their needs to be dismissed because we see it too often. A recent survey just a couple of years ago said that 40% of medical students assumed that black skin was thicker than white skin. People have always assumed this has been a problem that black people had a higher tolerance for pain. I could go into story yes. and story and story, but I find myself as the keeper of the health system of my household in making sure that I am my children and my husband's guardian in that way to make sure that they are okay. And then teaching my daughters how to go forth and do that. That's just one of the realities. And I don't even want to call it a burden. It is a burden, but it's just, it's just what you do. It's a reality. Yeah. That's the other reality. There's an Institute of Medicine study that shows that black men in particular are two thirds less likely to get pain medication for a broken bone or a broken bone. So we are assumed to have so much more pain tolerance and or the physicians are assuming that you want drugs because you are a drug addict, that when you have a broken bone, which I've had two, so it's a very painful situation. <laughs> they don't want to give you the drugs. Wow. And there, there, there's so many, we could talk of, this could be a whole other show. You, you, you know, you know, you, you know, I, I, they say we done stood you up. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to that's... say one thing too about you know go, the go, pain go and being too dangerous, too dangerous for women. You know this work. You know, we'll talk about childbirth. Let me talk about the pain of childbirth. I mean, honestly, if men had children, it would be a sacrament. 
It totally no, would no, be. No, we wouldn't have it's a like, world because it would be no <laughs> more people. It's a miracle, but, you know, but it women be no are more people. That'll they be it. That'll that. be it. But if you can go through that process and come out on the other side, you you really are a powerful woman. Absolutely. You, don't, you know, Mr. Mayor, that's, that's what... And, 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 you, are, you, you all are going to allow me to bring on, Sandra <laughs> Jenkins up. I bet you that. I, you know, Imagine you know, they have house, you know, let me go out go there. But you, I was, you, let, let me let me bring I, I Sandra went, Jenkins up. Do you know? Do you all know? Hold up. You all know we just got eleven minutes. I left. can't believe it. You know, I mean, that's the kind of way we do this thing, right? Right. Hey, Sandra Jenkins, how you hey. doing? Uh, good evening, everybody. I am just so, so, so absolutely excited to see Dr. Melvo. You are a staple in my salon. The ladies of the salon, yes, you are. You're a part of the family. So it's just so Absolutely. wonderful. And so I was so happy to uh, to, to learn that uh, Dr. Melvo would be with us tonight. And I have to say, um, um, Ms. Scott, uh, Terry Scott, you know, I will be purchasing your book. So yes, that will be one of the books <laughs> okay. that will be uh, shared in my salon. But I like to um, say that in the salon, it seems to me, that is still one of the most segregated spaces in America today in beauty mm -hmm. salons, very much similar to churches. Okay. So when you're in a, 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 a salon, a black salon, such as mine, you know, every day I have to have, um, you know, uh, Ida B. Wells and Madam CJ mall girls, you know, standing on their shoulders every single day. And Dr. Martin Luther King in his quote is judged not by the color of my skin. I had to add in the texture of my hair, mm. you know, because of the fact that that is how we function and that's how we're able to keep ourselves, you know, in alignment with society and be able to work hard and, and to earn a sufficient income in the industry that we could very much do so much better. You know, most salons that have these certain types of tools that are deterrents in the white community, when they come into your salon and they see certain types of implements right then and there, that's an indication that I don't want to service this place, which is all very, very, very untrue. Um, so, you know, just to hear these conversations, you know, we can go into more of a, a, a discussion about it, but um, I must say, thank you so very much. And um, I'm looking forward to uh, continuing the discussion. Oh, over there near <laughs> near Philadelphia. I mean, right outside of Philadelphia, yeah. but Philadelphia yeah. is home for Sandra Jenkins. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. And, and, Good. And Sandra, just say a little uh, bit about how we're bringing the health message through the shops as we were just talking about health disparities. Yes, the health message in the salon is something that you really, really got to look those in the eye. You got to really sit someone down and look eye to eye with them and to really hear what they are saying, you know, whether it relates to, you know, the family issues or whether it relates to their current circumstances and their conditions. Um, you, you have to connect with each client in order to get them to really gain some form of trust. It goes beyond just doing your hair. It goes beyond just, you know, being able to just uh, talk to someone about just general information. Sometimes you have to turn off that television and that radio to really listen to your clients. However, trying, you know, getting the message out and encourage them to, um, to understand the importance of quality health or either good health and implementing these type of exercises and these types of practices in your salon is immeasurable. Yeah, um, thank yeah. You very much so. You're right. Thank you. Let's so go to Don. Uh, thanks so much, uh, uh, Mike Dynamite Brown. Come on, bring him up to the stage. There we hey, go. Man. How's everybody? Um, hey man, this is this was the first uh, show that I've been on when I actually took notes mm -hmm. and. <laughs> To formulate what I've come up with uh, to going into the end of the show is that they need to rephrase how they make that statement. They say behind every black man is a strong black woman. Well, I say behind every conscious black man should be the spirit of the women on this panel because these women are phenomenal. Uh, I have a client uh, that, that patronizes me and, um, uh, 
sometimes she doesn't have all the money. She's young. And uh, for the last three, four, five years, uh, every year it's a new baby coming in. Um, I would not say that she was, uh, she had the opportunity that you guys have had in coming up. Uh, her circumstances were different, but uh, I would love to implement the power that you women have to share, to be able to get her in front of you guys to how, so she can see mm -hmm. that it's another way. Um, when you're on the ground level, you just see so many different levels and different walks of life. And when you come to the forefront, like we're on this platform and I see you distinguished ladies here, uh, how do we get what I see every day to, to this is the struggle that I'm in and the position that I play for my platform. How to how do I get these two together? But um, seeing you guys is just so inspiring and the stories I could cuddle up with a fire and a, a nice bottle of wine and listen to Dr. Malvo all night tell me those stories that I have <laughs> not heard. Uh, I wanna leave with this cause I can go on all night cause I actually took notes and I can never answer all of these questions but the most important one for me is for Dr. Malvo. And is she said that uh, the white supremacy is baked into the fabric of America. Uh, what are we really doing? Mm -hmm. If it's baked into the fabric, we're gonna wind up running into that wall if they're the fabric, if they're the wall we're gonna eventually have to see those people. So what are we really doing when we're fighting? Uh, you, 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 you know, that's interesting. And, and, and uh, Dr. Malvo, because we have only a few minutes, I'm gonna give you a minute to respond to that because he, he referenced you. So the question is, we, we're fighting for civil rights and all of that, but if, if racism is so ingrained, so inculcated into the fabric, of America, then can the system be reformed uh, since, since it is the foundation is racism? And if you don't understand racism, then anything else you think you understand will only serve to confuse you. Respond right. to me. Um, I would say that we have to not take, 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 turn the cake into crumbs, chop it up with knives, start all over really, look at, I mean, critical race theory is about the ways that the law reinforces inequality. This is not being taught to fourth graders or sixth graders or even 10th graders. It's a legal concept that's being taught in law schools. But what we know is that this is all reinforcing behavior that we have the opportunity and the ability to take back. The problem is that we go along to get along. We do micro changes, not mm -hmm. macro changes. We do change the icing on the cake, but the cake is still a racist cake. Tastes a little better if you have cherry icing as opposed to vanilla. <laughs> it is still a racist cake. And my brother, Michael, I want to say one thing to you. Don't say anybody's behind. I'm a strong black woman behind. If we around, we surround, we're shoulder to shoulder. Ain't nobody behind nobody. We have to be together. I told Minister Farrakhan once upon a time, after Million Man March, I said, you cannot win a war if you disable half of the army. So anytime you put black women, behind, <laughs> you essentially are saying that we're not equal to you. And, and, and Dynamite, just uh, do a quick introduction so that they can meet our, some of our leaders out here in, in the program. Well, I'm, I'm Mike Brown. I'm the manager of the shop spa in Highsville, Maryland, about nine miles from uh, White House. Uh, I'm a certified community health care worker by the state of Maryland. And uh, I just love advocating from the platform that I have. We see about eight to a thousand people a week and we're steadily relaying information uh women grown men children we're just relaying the information saying you guys is so empowering uh it definitely uh gives me a vision to what it should look like it's just how to do it is the question it was at mike and fred's shop where the very first COVID 19 vaccinations in a barber shop took place anywhere in the state of maryland and that launched the campaign that we're in right now so yeah, give them some snaps. Absolutely. There's a whole, can you believe what time it is? It, you Mr. know, Mayor? I was, I was, you were, you were not looking at the time and I, I was looking <laughs> and I said, Dr. T going to take me over. We, we do, you know, we're one minute away. Let me thank you. Let me thank you. Let me thank you. Let me stop out. Stop right now and say, thank you. Uh, the words 
uh, are inadequate. Thank you has all come to my mind uh, for your sharing your truth, believing that we all possess us of some truth. And as we bring our truths together, then and only then do we get closer to the truth. You have inspired me. Yes. I have, I have obviously uh, learned a lot from you today. Uh, and let me also say this. This is not your last time on the cutting edge. Uh, you are invited. In fact, you have an open invitation to join us at any juncture that you want to. We thank you so much. This uh, was a great show. Uh, yeah. We will put this one up as one of the greatest shows we've ever done. Absolutely. Right. And we, we, were... and we thank you so much for, 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 for sharing with us. Uh, um, Miss Dorothy Walker. Thank you so much for 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 being here. Uh, let's give her some snaps and and uh, love 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 to you, uh, uh, Dr. Terry and Scott. An incredible new book coming out. Thank you. Tell people the name of your book quickly. <laughs> I ordered Absolutely. Lynching and Leisure: Race and the Transformation of Mob Violence in Texas. And thank you, thank you for talking about it and for ordering. Yes. Absolutely. Good. So we're going to make sure we do that. And Dr. Julian Malvo, my dear friend and mentor, uh, just the last 10 seconds. I'm just grateful to be here with you. Uh, Dr. Scott is going to be my new best friend. I'm so excited <laughs> about her book. I want to have her on my radio program, WPFW, uh, one of the Mondays. I'm on Mondays at 9 a.m. Malvo, exclamation point, because I am your exclamation point. Got to keep it real and keep it moving. Right. What, what's your station that you're on? That's 89.3 FM, Monday mornings, 9 a.m. Eastern. And you said what is it? And we'll, we'll put it in the newsletter. Okay, uh, good. Yeah, we'll get it out. Yeah, no, let her say it. I mean, that's fine. Go ahead, say it quickly. Uh, 89.3 FM um, oh. or WPFWFM.org. Oh, yeah. So you can change something. Okay, all right. All right. Okay, all right. All right. All right. All right. Well, 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 we went over a, 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 a minute. <laughs> You know, because because we do that sometimes. Right? 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 But anyway, let me say this. I love love every one of you. Thank you all so much. Uh, as always, I like to uh, leave you with these two words. Remember that I love you with a perfect love. But more importantly, remember, you got the power. Thank you for joining with us on the Cutting Edge show. We'll see you next week. Same time, same station. Bye bye.